Hello, everyone, and welcome to the presentation on our new regulations for 2023 for the Ecotex Association. Uh, my name is Jonathan Burley. I am the Eco Passport product manager here, and I will be presenting the English version of the new regulations presentation. And with that, let's get started. And let's get started with labeling news, specifically the label editor. So all layout versions of the Ecotex labels can now be downloaded via the label editor in the My Ecotex platform, no longer in the label detail section as some of you might have been become accustomed to. And by clicking on the download label, which you can see here in the bottom right, uh, the user will be redirected to the tab label editor where the label hang tag can be downloaded. Specifically for Made in Green, we have some updates as well. It is now possible for retailers that do not own a Made in Green label, but do sell Made in Green label products in the, their assortments. So they can now receive an advertisement label. And the number of the advertisement label can be validated on the Ecotex label check, which you can see a little bit down below here. Uh, to obtain one of these advertisement retailer labels, please contact your Made in Green contact person if this is something that you are interested in. Probably the biggest portion of today's uh, new regulations and changes is the changes in limit values. Uh, specifically for the standard 100, the leather standard, and the eco passport. So at the beginning of each year, the Ecotex Association up updates the applicable test criteria and limit values and requirements for its range of certifications and labels. And here we will be presenting to you a complete list of all the changes to the RSL so the restricted substance list of the standard 100, the leather standard, and the eco passport. These changes will go into effect on April 1st, 2023 for the standard 100 and the leather standard. However, for the eco passport, these changes will go into effect this year on February 1st. So be, please be aware of that. But before we really start about what has been added, we will quickly be discussing um, su substances that are or were under observation. Under observation means that these substances have not yet been added to the restriction substance list. There are mere candidates, and we are uh, we have been checking, researching if they are harmful for the human body as well as their relevance for the textile industry. Now, for the standard 100 specifically, we have removed some substances under observation, um, CMC or CMK, TC, MBT, and OIT. These have all been removed from under observation. They will be kept for the leather standard and eco passport. They, there they are part of the restricted substance list, but they will not be added for the standard 100. And for all certifications, we have removed CI Disperse Red 60, this colorant from under observation. It will not be added to the restricted substance list. <clears throat> there are some substances that require more analysis from us and which we are keeping for under observation at the moment. Specifically, these are the bisphenols AF, F, and S, as well as certain diisocyanates. <coughs> Excuse me. We also have some new substances that we have set under observation, and these are dermatrizole, which was added for um, standard 100, leather standard, and eco passport, and N ethyl to pyrodilidone, which uh, is also called NEP which has been added for the standard 100 and the leather standard for under observation, but has directly been added for the eco passport, which we will be touching upon a little bit, so a little bit later. 
Now we have also added some substances to our restricted substance list, which were under observation before. Specifically, these are um, the substances you can see right here. So these, uh, this toluene, this aniline, and benzidine, they have been added to all um, certifications with a limit value of 20 milligrams per kilogram. The 2-methoxy-1 propanol has been added only for the Annex 6 of the standard 100, not the Annex 4, uh, with a limit value of 10 milligrams per kilogram, and it ha has been added for the Eco Passport with a limit value of 50 milligrams per kilogram. The 1,2-deatoxyethane has been added with 10 milligrams per kilogram. However, for the Eco Passport, it has been added with 100 milligrams per kilogram. Then we have also added 2-MBT, with 1,000 milligrams per kilogram, as well as the colorant solvent yellow 34, or it's also called CI basic yellow 2, with 50 milligrams per kilogram as its limit value. We have also added some pesticides under observation, which you can see here. I will not be counting all of them up, uh, but what should be kept in mind is that the limit values are 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram for the product class one of the standard 100 as an end leather standard. And for the product class says two to four, the limit is one milligram per kilogram. For the eco passport, we don't really have limits. Uh, we just have it as no intentional use. So they should just not be used as a part of the, um, the products themselves. <clears throat> we have also had some PFAS changes. As you can see here, uh, I won't be going into too much detail, but please be aware that the limit values have gone down quite a bit. We have some sum values that are down to 25 micrograms per kilogram, but mostly they are at 250 micrograms per kilogram. And this is relevant for the standard 100, lead standard, and ECOS passport. We also now have a total organic fluorine content, which we check. So in general, we ban the intentional use of PFCs or PFAS in the standard 100, leather standard and eco passport stand starting uh, this year, 2023. And we are starting with a limit of 10 milligrams per kilogram. Um, however, there will be a one year transition period for product categories two to four and there will be no transition, uh, but however, there will be no transition period for product class one as well as eco passport. Um, there is also special accept exception for personal um, protective equipment or PPE, which will get an exception for the total organic fluorine content. We will not be checking it there. We have also added some substances of very high concern or SVHCs. As you can see here, um, these three have been added ex uh, to the standard 100, leather standard eco passport, but the one in the middle, as you can see, has only been added to the standard 100 and X6, as well as the eco passport. And there are some substances that have only been added for the eco passport, but not the standard 100 or leather standard, uh, which are two MBT the NEP, which we touched upon a little bit before, both at 1,000 milligrams per kilogram as a limit value. We also have the trimethylphosphate, which was added with 100 milligrams per kilogram, as well as certain paraboric acid and sodium salts with 1,000 milligrams per kilogram. <clears throat> you have also added some pH exceptions. So for wet wipes, the pH is now from 3.5 to 7.5 in the standard 100. And for chamois leather, the pH is now on 3.45 until 10 in that range for the leather standard specifically. <clears throat> we also had some changes for MCCP and SCCP specifically for the leather standard. Uh, the MCCP limit value is reduced to 100 milligrams per kilogram. And the sum limit value created here is 100 milligram per kilogram as well. 
so for MCCP and SCCP. With that, we are finished with the uh, limit value changes for the standard 100 eco passport leather standard. So let's also go into some leather origin changes. We have made some changes here in the standard because we really want to know the origin of the processed hide or skin. Um, and if it is expected to be known, uh, now we have it, have it so that it is expected to be known uh, that this and the source has to be in accordance with the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora and other uh, legal requirements. We also have an implemented traceability system um, and risk analysis, which we would highly recommend uh, to, for you to control and monitor the possible. So we want you to have knowledge of the possible involvement of uh, farms and, and hide or skin suppliers, uh, if they are in any way involved with uh, deforestation so that we can exclude the risk of the hide and skins coming from those kind of area uh, of both legal and illegal deforestation, especially for hides and skin with the origin of Brazil and Paraguay. A strict traceability system is highly recommended to exclude any involvement of deforestation in the Amazon biome. So Physical marking and reliable data system is also recommended to be implemented in the production process to ensure traceability for unprocessed or incoming leather material, at least back to the slaughterhouse group region or country by targeting full transparency back to the farm. And for this, we have also added a few new questions to the application form itself. So the first one is, please indicate the country of Oregon, uh, origin for your hide, skin, or leather material you, which you are applying for. So you can add the, the country. Then we have another question of, uh, do you consider in your purchasing practice that your un or processed hide or skin is coming from species, appropriate husbandry, and animal welfare, considering animal fa farming and facilities and or facilities? You can answer yes or partially or no. And the third question is, uh, is a risk analysis in regard of legal and illegal deforestation to avoid leather material coming from such areas implemented or considered in your purchasing practice? Which where you can answer yes or only for leather materials from countries with high risk of deforestation or no. So much uh, for the new leather standard. We have something else which is pretty exciting, which is uh, one of two new certificates, specifically organic cotton, the new organic cotton certificate. So this is a new certification where we focus on the traceability <coughs> of um, also the chain of custody. So starting from the ginning process up to spinning, knitting and weaving, dyeing and confection, we really want to have each step certified along this chain uh, in, to really see if, the, it is, if there is full organic cotton so we can avoid any kind of greenwashing. And we also um, work together with the certificate, certificate uh, from the iPhone family of standards at the cotton farm level. So here we also have two kinds of label with organic cotton. We have the one, the full organic cotton, which is simply called organic cotton. Here, 100% of the material should be organic cotton. Um, and along the whole value chain, you should be, this should be traceable with either the organic cotton certificate or um, the, the traceability certificates. But while testing, no more than 10% is allowed to be detected as GMO, and it must pass any tests for pesticides. With that, one would receive the organic cotton label. There is a kind of in-between label, which we call 
organic cotton blended, where only 70% of the material has to be organic cotton. Um, here it is similar across the whole value chain. The certificate has to be, the organic cotton has to be traced with either traceability certificates or the organic cotton certificate. Here is the same, GMO test has to be less than 10%, test for pesticides have to be passed, and with that one would receive the organic cotton blended label. If it is less than 70% organic cotton, it will just receive the usual typical standard 100 certificate, which also involves a GMO and pesticide test, um, and also yeah, which is where one would receive the standard 100 label. And yeah, these are probably the most important differences to the standard 100. Uh, for one, more pesticides are covered <clears throat> within the organic cotton. There is an on-site visit not every three years, but every year, and it has to be performed before the certification. And for the transaction certificates, uh, from ginning, spinning onwards, uh, they're only allowed to have the transaction uh, certificates from Ecotex. And these are followed each, uh, follows each change of ownership. There has to be a certificate. And so the full chain of custody is covered. And the requirement for the input material, so at the farm level, have to be farm level certifications. So it's IFOAM, the family of standards. Okay, let's move on with the changes to the Eco Passport. First of all, starting April um, 2023, there will be a mandatory self-assessment. So up to this point, the self-assessment had always been voluntary, but as I said, on the 1st of April this year, the self-assessment will become mandatory for the Ecotex Eco Passport certification. The on-site visit will remain optional for the time being, and the first certification or renewal issued after the 1st of April must be accompanied by a valid self-assessment. Uh, for certain existing customer, a transitional period may be applied. Please ask your institutes if this is something that would apply to you. There have also been certain updates to ZDHC, which uh, the, is the organization for um, abbreviated from zero discharge of hazardous chemicals. So for those who um, know, pro probably most of you know that they have published their new manufacturer restricted substance list from 2.0, it has been updated to 3.0, uh, and they have also added a new conformance guidance 2.0 used to be 1.0 which both will be going into effect on february 2023 the eco passport will meet these requirements in the coming year to guarantee a smooth transition for all customers um, so for the mrsl 3.0 specifically of the zdhc we are, are already fully ready for these changes um, from the MRLs L2 to the MRLs L3 in 2023 this year. That way you won't miss a beat in your renewal or any new EcoPassport certification. A little bit more for cons the conformance guidance 2.0. So the DDC had changed their requirements for their different conformance levels. For those who don't know, there are three different conformance level, three being the highest, one being the lowest. Um, so for level one, this will mostly stay the same and will include the screening and the analytical testing. Level two now includes the on-site visit in addition to the self-assessment. And level three, which used to be uh, the on-site visit, now includes a chemical hazard assessment uh, capability plus evidence that level one and two principles of the ZDHC MRSL conformance are fulfilled. <clears throat> and here's a little overview what this really means for the eco passport certifications options so before if one had a CAS number screening and an analytical verification this would lead to level one 
not really any changes here. So this will still lead to level one. For the self-assessment, um, some new extra questions have been added. So as of February, every um, renewal or new EcoPassport certification has to be accompanied with the new uh, self-assessment questions. The self-assessment will become mandatory anyway in 2023. And this used to lead to level two, now it also leads to level one. However, with the on-site visit, um, we have to, there are also there, there have been some new questions added. So there have to be a verification of the new criteria uh, for this management system as of February. And it used to lead to level three, but now leads to level two of the ZDHD conformance. Uh, the chemical hazard assessment is now part of the self-assessment and on-site visit that has been included there. Uh, yeah, we've included the new criteria uh, for management systems and the chemical hazard assessment. This used to not be available before 2023 on February. As of February, this will be available and this will lead to the ZDHC conformance level three. <coughs> So now let's move on to step. Specifically, let's start with the impact calculator for the carbon and water footprint. So the impact calculator has been available now for some time, specifically almost a year now for our step customers since January, 2022. And by logging into the, uh, the My Ecotex profile of the step customer, they could then do that in the step assessment. We now have 59 step customers, customers who are using the impact calculator already. And it can now be, as it is distinguished between validated reports and non-validated reports from April, 2023. We have had some updates here. So we have improved some um, bugs. Uh, they have been uh, solved. We have updated the emission factors. We have made some design improvements in the material and process section. And in the energy and water section, the following input areas are now updated. For electricity, we have divided it into direct and indirect. And for fuel, it was previously called steamed. It was also divided into direct and indirect. Um, we also have some uh, results are divided into different scopes. And final report in now includes the statement based on self-declaration data and input values in the case the data has not been verified by an institute. <clears throat> we also quickly want to talk about uh, the Beehive, which is a digital chemical solution tailored to the Ecotex step requirements. So the approach here was of this project was the involvement of the chemical management module by digitalization of the chemical uh, inventory that each production site has. So the Beehive um, is used here as a supporting software in the background where databases of chemical products can be used by our customers. The, the Beehive can be used by step customers with chemicals only. So the goal here is to ease and automize the auditing process for factories and auditors and to enhance the overall data quality, close data gaps that, are, um, that can happen and track continuously track the chemical inventory. In 2022, we started this project in uh, the beginning of 2022. Then in Q2 and Q3, we had certain IT developments. We then at in the end of the year uh, started testing and have now gone into the, so based on what we had seen in the testing period, we are now going into improvements based on the feedback we received. And the plan is to go live as of April in 2023. 
then is where the step customers can use should be able to use the beehive with within their certificate <clears throat> coming back to zdhc uh, for step we are looking at the wastewater testing alignment um, so what has been done here to ease the process for our customers and work toward an industry alignment, we have successfully updated the limits for wastewater testing in alignment towards ZDHC wastewater um, 2.0. Uh, what's new here? For some parameters, testing required has been added in the Annex 3. Uh, one parameter for facilities with direct discharge in the field of wastewater effluents has been changed. Facilities with indirect discharge must no longer test the treated discharge wastewater for conventional parameters. Sludge testing has been simplified as well for our step customers. And facilities producing viscose and modal fibers do not require to test all the parameters listed in the standard. And special requirements are mentioned under Annex 6 in the standard here. We've uh, updated the wastewater sampling point for indirect discharge. So uh, certain sampling points for indirect discharge are now defined in the standard under Annex 5.1.2. And facilities with indirect discharge, um, the treated discharged wastewater must no longer be tested for conventional parameters. Coming back to sludge testing, um, sludge testing is now only necessary for MRSL group one, so AP, APEO, and APEOs for group 12, which are the PAH, and group seven, only part of the chlorinated toluenes. And the limit adopted for the P has been adopted now for PAH from 0 0.6 to 0 0.2. <clears throat> And for the viscose and modal production facilities producing viscose and modal fibers do not require to test all parameters listed in Annex 3, as stated before, and only APOs, total chrome, cadmium, copper, nickel, chrome, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, um, in Annex 6.1 are all conventional parameters listed, which are also relevant. <clears throat> we also have a bit more alignment with the SVHC and REACH and some others for the STEP MRSL. So firstly, the new MRSL compounds of Annex 3, we have added some um, groups to the, some Arula mines. As you can see here, I will not be listing all of them since the names are quite long. Uh, we have also added for group four hazardous colorants, which you can see down here. And we have added one organotin compound, dipropyl tin. There have been changes to PFAS as well, because uh, there have been updates from the commission regulation of the EU in August, 2021. And, um, for the, for the, this means that for the MRSL group six, PFCs, uh, per and polyfluorinated compounds and per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, so PFAS, uh, have now been added according to the OECD guidelines, which are some various substances which have been added, not listed here. We have also added the uh, NEP, which we discussed earlier, uh, under observation, which had also been added for standard 100 and the leather standard, as well as 2MBT, which had been added for the other three standard uh, yeah, certificates as well. As well as the three S SVHCs, which we added for standard 100, leather standard eco passport, um, which you might remember from before. They have been added to step group. 14 as well. And then we also have glutar aldehyde, um, which has been added under group 14 
and an additional footnote has been added for the standard um, for version one of 2023. And the footnote is, it is accepted as an in-camp preservative. <clears throat> we also have some updates from the step assessment itself. So we made a big review of the step assessment and made a lot of changes. So 93 questions in total have changed. Four questions have been deleted or consolidated. There are seven new questions which have been added. Um, examples cover for leather, skin or leather material uh, in accordance with CITES or other legal requirements. Uh, consider a raw material and purchasing practice as well as new questions for the wet spinning process. 59 questions with changes regarding structure or wording um, have happened. So additional exclusion criteria were added due to benchmarking criteria of the green button 2.0 and detailed information about the changes are shared with our customers. Uh, supporting documents for the questionnaire and new regulation products files are available. And I want to also talk about more exciting news, which is our second new certificate, the Responsible Business, which has launched at the end of last year. So Responsible Business uh, was introduced due to global expectations on due diligence. We have the EU proposal for the Directive on Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence, the German Supply Chain Act, and here in Switzerland, the indirect counter proposal to the Corporate Responsibility Initiative of 2022. There are also some others which you can all see down below here. <clears throat> so with the uh, Responsible Business Certificate, we are trying to look at human rights, the environment, management process, and global supply chain. Um, but what we're really looking at is the management processes of a company where we want to evaluate how well human rights and environmental due diligence obligations are integrated into the business enterprise and business activities. And the purpose here is to understand the risks in the supply chains and to stop or at least mitigate those risks. Um, so this is a new certification for brands and retailers. So responsible business, as I said before, pre prevents or mitigates existing and potential negative impacts of business operation within their own activities, the supply chain and the wider business relationships. Our target group here really for this responsible business certificate are brands or brand groups as well as a retailer on traders, so pretty downstream of the supply chain. And the benefits for having one of these kind of responsible business certificates is that you will have a structured uh, approach to your um, how, how you approach the uh, kind of uh, business dealings you have here will have a modular structure of the certification, so assessments of the status quo of your due diligence implementations in the company, and you will have an independent audit and certification from Ecotex. And this also facilitates uh, reporting to the different authorities. So, we have our standard as well as an implementation manual, which can be found on our website, as well as an assessment questionnaire. If the assessment questionnaire has been filled out and we can perform an audit, that is how the certification of responsible business is then received. <clears throat> A little bit about um, the responsible business facts and figures. So the label um, responsible business it can be received after the certification, which is a new Ecotex 
uh, label. The, the costs are pretty individual according to the complexity of the business model and uh, the efforts that have to be taken. The duration to receive one of those uh, uh, certifications as of the, um, handing in the assessment. So starting from submission of documents is around eight to 12 weeks, but of course, depending from the level of due diligence implementations on the documentation level. And um, the communication here is internal business communications within B2B as well to as B2G communication, which is targeted. And a little bit about the timeline. Lastly, we started the launch in November of 2022. So it's a fairly young certificate. Um, in, and this is just right on time because the Supply Chain Act has just gone into effect. And end of uh, Q1 of this year, we will also have an auditor training and an external webinar for the Responsible Business Certificate. And as uh, of uh, January 2024, we will have our first document revision. And with that, we're finished. Uh, thank you very much and uh, for paying attention. And I hope you have had an in-depth experience here with our new regulations so you have an idea what's coming this year. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>